Alô? Good day, good night, good afternoon. Welcome, 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 welcome to the baby, baby, le, 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 le. Welcome, welcome, welcome to today, 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 welcome today. Welcome to the birds. Welcome to the qua, qua, qua. <laughs> welcome. A very warm welcome to Ernesto Neto. Thanks so much to Sam Callan and the Bider Foundation uh, for the invitation to speak here. And uh, on the way here, I remember that this series of conversations we are doing with Sam actually started almost 20 years ago when we interviewed Albert Hoffmann here, the, actually in Basel, the inventor of uh, LSD. He was at the time almost uh, 100 years old. Uh, we're going to talk about that as well today, but about many, many other things with Ernesto. And this is not our first conversation. And actually, when we last time did uh, an interview in Cáceres in Spain with Isabella Mora, uh, we actually, at was the inauguration of Helga de Alvear's foundation, um, I asked you for the first time about the epiphany. And I wanted to know when it all began and what was your first epiphany. So maybe we could begin with that. Well, the reality is that we came together in the airplane from London to Spain. And then he began to make an interview with me on the, on the airplane. And he asked something about my first epiphany, but I didn't understand that because I didn't understand the word <laughs> epiphany. <laughs> and I think he realized that because I didn't know what to say. And suddenly on the conversation, he said something that he, uh, in a way was a way to explain to me what would be epiphany. So he was very gentle, and then I begin to know, oh, epiphany, epiphany is that, because it's a beautiful word, né? epiphany. But I didn't understand the meaning of it. Uh, and what was really weird is that while uh, we was, uh, and there was many interviews, and suddenly I begin to, to think, to concentrate, I don't know what was going on, but uh, I begin to feel that my first epiphany was my birth. And I begin to feel myself inside the belly of my mother. And I begin to hear my mother. I begin to hear my father outside of the belly of my mother. And I begin to feel the, the, the myself getting out. I don't know, even if he was on this stage when he asked me that I begin to feel that. But the reality that the day after, because uh, I, we, we came and we left together with, with uh, just sp overnight there, I mean, not sleeping. And the day after, I think, he, uh, or maybe I arrived and I slept in, in London. I was installing an exhibition at the Hayward Gallery. I think it was Sunday. And I begin to, I begin to write down this situation of my own birth. And I begin to get in a force that I have no idea what was going on, how it was coming out of me. But the end was it, and when I was uh, born, uh, I was writing and crying, you know, strongly, very much uh, alone there in that room with that pencil or pen and a paper. And this text had been put in the exhibition as part of work that you, you can read like that. But uh, I don't know <laughs> what has happened because these things come now. We have to respect it because this is the spiritual dimension inside of us. Now I understand it better, you know. But uh, so uh, I don't know if, uh, that, if my birth was like that. But there was this moment that I have this epiphany. Or maybe this is even another name than epiphany. I don't know. Because naming things is these things. Now how to name feelings, how to name uh, situations. Now that's what we've been doing since uh, millions of years, maybe. And you came in contact with design and architecture very early because your mother was a designer, an industrial designer, and uh, your father an engineer. And uh, when we talked about beginnings, you once sent me a very long letter 
about a really important experience you made as a kid with the architecture of, uh, of Zanini. And we, of course, uh, are much more familiar with Mendes da Rocha or with you know, Oscar Niemeyer or Lina Bobardi from Brazilian architecture than with Zanini. So I thought it would be kind of interesting to hear a little bit more about this, this Zanini experience and just also you know, your first encounters, in a way, with art and architecture. Zanini. Zanini, you know when you, when you go somewhere uh, in Germany and you see a kind of a construction that you say, oh, this is a Mills, Mills van der Rohe, but it's not a Mills van der Rohe, but it's a kind of a, it's a spirit of him yeah, that becomes, that's my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, you know, becomes in many places on the German architecture. Zanini is like that. You go to Bahia, you go to countryside in Rio de Janeiro, mountains everywhere, and you see houses that they are Zanini houses, but they are not made by Zanini. But the spirit of the Zanini is there. Zanini is a guy from the south of Bahia who had very much uh, strong connection to the popular culture, uh, indigenous culture, you know, African culture, uh, fishermen's. I don't know his history, to be honest, you know. But he, he, he was someone who made maquettes. He made maquettes for these guys, like he, Lúcio Costa, Oscar Niemeyer, Heide, uh, uh, for the modernists. And suddenly he began to do design, and suddenly he began to do architecture. And he began to do some house on some hills in Rio de Janeiro. They are just incredible because, in a way, it brings the spirit of the colonial times, the favelas, uh, there are houses uh, built in a hill now, so there is a lot of structure. And these structures are made by wood, very intelligent, balanced, and always visible. Now you always see the structure. Uh, also, the places like this Frank Lloyd House, the one for the waterfall, you know, we have different positions, levels of living room, room, uh, dining room, uh, sleeping room, you know. Uh, some chairs, incredible uh, chairs. And chairs, no, stairs. Chairs also, but the staircases, that is really... Uh, and, and using a lot of uh, demolition. Uh, demolition, is it understandable? Yeah, yeah. demolition. Uh, things that was people are putting down, old stuff in Rio de Janeiro, so everything was very cheap to, to build. Uh, and my father and my mother, uh, my father had a crash on his business with his cousins, and they get some money from my grandfather, and they bought a land in this place, and they built one house of Zanini. Uh, and, and this house, for example, there was the, uh, the, the floor of the house uh, was made by granite. And I, I never understand exactly that granite, because I grow and I see granite in many different ways, but not like that way, kind of un, unsquare on the sides, you know, kind of not polished, but also not this unpolished that is ki kind of uh, looks like had been polished and, and unpolished, you know, kind of made of. And one day I asked my mother, some years ago, well, mother, how was that uh, uh, floor there? And he said, uh, she said it was, this granite was the sidewalk of Lapa, which is a very popular neighborhood, and they were taking out the stones of Lapa. And it was free for anyone who could arrive with a truck and put it there and take it out. So Zanini had these things to, to, to find, uh, to work with what is there, you know. And it was very transparent, a lot of glass. So the communication between nature, uh, by the materiality, by the using of uh, uh, the molish stuff, but also by the architecture, there was a transparency to the, to, the, to the environment. Really amazing. And, and this moment of my life it was the moment that we moved to this area, was a kind of uh, off Rio de Janeiro, a little bit avant-garde artistically living. And, uh, and my mother, at this time, just before, she was beginning to study uh, industrial design. So there was this thing, because she was older, a lot of her classes was in my home, 
I mean, our home. So uh, I had this contact. And I think the spirit of Ligia Clark, that he, I feel very much inside of me, came very much because of it, because the spirit of Ligia Clark was in the, in the universities in that time. And I think it came to, to our home through my mother. And it was a wonderful time. We, left, we lived, it was a beautiful house, but of course, in, <laughs> in the two or three or four or five years, something like that, yeah, I, uh, everything felt down, you know. My family went bankrupt my, in every sense, and my parents, they broke, you know. Uh, it was a nightmare. <laughs> And a lot of trauma, you know, a lot of sadness because it was so cool to live together. But it was a big mess too, crazy parties in that time. There was some school sometimes, Portela, who make a kind of party there. It, it was a, a moment very crazy in Brazil too, you know. We are, you are living this just after the 70s, so the politics had been hardcore uh, uh, censorship everywhere, uh, people being killed, né? and it was this moment of that uh, uh, the freedom become, became to, you know, uh, free love and this kind of thing, but you could not talk about politics. Now we could not, bon, here, pff, this I think it would be even forbidden to have a situation like that. Uh, there would be a censorship guy here looking what we are doing, what we are talking. But if you are like, uh, uh, you go out with some friends that you don't know, yesterday we were in a dinner, we wouldn't be able to, to talk what we think about politics because you never know if the person beside here would be someone to tell the, the, the military police that you were talking about that, communist, or this kind of thing, subversive. And they would catch you, bring you to the under the policy underground, torture you to know who you are, who you're dealing with, who are the chief, who are the people. Uh, so it was a kind of a, a very a crazy time in Brazil. And I, and I have to say something to you. In, my, in the work I've been doing since my life, uh, there is an ethical point that uh, everything that you see there, because it's always in relationship that works. Now. You, you never, it's a relationship between, uh, you have these works here, you have the relationship between the stocking and the amount of lead or the amount of spices and the relation of it when it falls down and the relation between it and the other one on the side. So it's always relationship. Everything that I do since then because one thing is together with the other, one thing uh, happens to be together. No? Uh, and, and there is an idea that of transparency, not just in the uh, direct idea of the word transparency, but in the idea that you can understand how the things, how it is happening there in that moment, how uh, had we made it, uh, how uh, if you want to make a sculpture like that, with the stockings and the lead, you can do that. You know, you just pick up a stocking, cut the the leg here, make a knot, cut the the front put it inside out, roll it, it's good to stretch a bit, keep a kind of tension, it's good to hold here the knot, the knot that's inside, and keep the tension a little bit, and then you can put this kind of liquid, né, that amount of lead becomes a liquid thing, inside of it, and then you let it fall down. You can do with gravels too, it hurts more the, the piece and it's not so heavy. You can do, do with beads, you can do with spice, you can do it anything, so you can go, go home and do it by yourself, you know, don't need it. I love this idea, that's like our show, do it. Everybody can just do it. But, yeah, do it, yeah. But uh, the, just to finish, uh, but the idea of transparency and the idea that you can do it, that you know what's going on there. This was, uh, in an ethical point of view, very important because uh, we had lived this very moment that the people doesn't know what was doing and very bad things were be doing under the table. But you know, now we live in a democracy and there's still a lot of things very bad is being doing under the table, so I don't know what to do, you know, so I really think about what to do yeah. now. <laughs> and when we talked last night, uh, you know, about the, the beginnings, um, we talked of course, and I thought it was interesting to begin actually with Zanini, because in this long letter you once wrote me, you know, 
a lot of things actually for your later work seem to be connected to this experience you had in this house, the way it connects to nature, the way it connects to environment. But then of course, at a certain moment, you came into art and it started very early because at 16 you actually went to a class, it was a course at the, the Museum of Modern Art, but then you were somehow afraid to go into art. And then it took another three years that in, at the age of 19 you all of a sudden failed an astronomy test and then came, came into art. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about your way you know, into art, how then art came to you, how you came to art, but also I was very interested in the first piece you then made, you know, which is the number one in your catalogue, Raisonné. I always think it's very interesting, you know, in the work of an artist when student work ends and when, you know, an artist decides this is the first work where an artist found his or her or their, their language. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. It's a difficult question, but that's why it's the only question we rehearsed. No, 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 it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, let's go now. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I wanted to be an astronaut. That's the reality. Yeah, floating on the skies, you know. Yeah. That was, you know, when I was a kid, that's what I wanted. Uh, when I was in the uh, kindergarten, a uh, teacher made a ring. And she asked everyone, uh, what would be your profession when you get old? And people began to say. And when she arrived on me, I said, I want to be an astronaut. <laughs> and I never forget that, you know. And there was a girl named Patricia. And this girl was a girl that he, I like her, she likes me, this kind of little children, you know. Uh, and I met her. Uh, when I was in the last year of the, uh, what you call it in English, I guess, high school before university. Uh, I changed school and I met her. And uh, we were quite different at that moment. <laughs> Maybe we always had been. But uh, yeah, th this, this love is forever. Huh? And, and then we began to talk. Uh, one day there were some other people and then she said, you know, Ernesto, I remember the day that the teacher made the ring and she asked it. Uh, profession when everybody said, yeah, yeah, I remember. And she said, yeah, I get very angry with the teacher. She said it to me. I said, why you get angry with the teacher? She said, no, because you said that you wanted to be an astronaut. And she said to you that this is not a profession. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I don't remember that. And it's good that you forget things. Uh, Friederico Nietzsche uh, said that the most important thing of us is to forget things. No? But I forgot this one. I don't know if I said that I would be an artist, what the professor would say. In Brazil, probably would say the same. But uh, if you ask me, or if somebody tell me that I would be an artist one month before I get in this art class where I did this, what is considered my, I don't know, it's the first, first school art piece. But when I look to that piece, I said, that's what I want to do in my life. But if you would say to me, one month before, I would say no. <laughs> Come on, the joking. Even though I was someone that I was always going to the theater, always going to the music, not really going to, to art uh, museums. I have gone when I was a child with my parents, but uh, this was not something that I used to do it in Brazil. It's not like he here that art has such a presence. Nowadays, much more uh, in, the, in our culture. But uh, but the reality is that, as Hans said, I made a test to, to be an astronomer. Yeah, because astronaut it was kind of <laughs> exotic. <laughs> Maybe I had listened to the teacher and I didn't realize that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I failed. And then I went to Bahia. And on Bahia, I met uh, a friend of mine, Virginia. She was not my friend now, but we had an affair. And she said, oh, there is a... Uh, there is a there's a class from uh, sculpture on clay at Park Lage. I said, ah, cool. And then I went there. She came with me. I put my name there, class. I went to the class. And Park Lage is this fantastic place in Rio de Janeiro that you have this class. I mean, fantastic. It's fantastic, Mati. Yeah, what can I say about that? It's really always trying to survive. Now. Everything's always so difficult there. But. Uh, but, but uh, it was academic school, and it was 
uh, there was uh, a transformation to become an avant-garde school, and it became very important on the 80s about the paintings movement in Brazil. And it was on the 80s, it was like 83, 84, something like that, 84, I guess. And I, I went there, and the professor was this kind, making kind of uh, clay sculpture, bronze, and this kind of thing, you know, uh, people, you know, like uh, not really art, you know. And I arrived there, and, uh, like a uh, young guy, uh, 19 years old, he looked at me and said, look, man, if you want to make this sculpture, I teach you how to take model, uh, mold, and everything, but if you want to, to find out what is art, <laughs> you gotta go somewhere else, because here, this is dead here, you know, it's, it's something like that, he said. I said, okay, let me be here, it's fine. And then I begin to make a sculpture on clay, I did this one, and I looked to that and said, that's what I want to do in my life. And it was funny, because the only truth that I had in that moment, because I didn't know anything, you know, I was a guy, uh, you know, uh, living life, uh, smoking a lot of pot, that was the only serious thing in my life, to be very honest. <laughs> and, and then that's how it began. But uh, from there, you know, with, uh, what is the first sculpture now, nah, because uh, this is difficult. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of interesting because when we spoke about it last night, you said that you kind of went from the mechanical to the organic, you know? So that like your work as a student had a kind of a mechanical component. And of course all your work we know, you know, uh, and all the work we are all familiar with is very, very organic. And so in a way, you said that actually your last mechanical piece, which then led to the organic piece, is kind of the beginning. I thought that was somehow interesting. So this last piece, the name is Barbo. Uh, what happened is that uh, one day I went to the, I wanted to do a conceptual piece. I have not very good idea what was conceptual art and something like that, you know, because I, I never had been a very good student and I studied now all of it and even the conceptual art was not so uh, uh, everywhere like now. But, uh, the idea was to have a kind of uh, a kind of a square with a four mic base and a ball here. Then another square like this thick, 60 by 6 by this thick, uh, made by foam and a ball. And this ball, the the weight of this ball would deformate a little bit this foam. And the third one would be a kind of a frame hanging with a textile. And this textile would have a ball who would uh, deformate this textile. Of course, I went to the textile. And then I went to the house of my grandmother. And she always, uh, always had been with my grand aunt there. And she had done many things, uh, little uh, clothes. And, and she always was sewing or painting pot or making food. And my grandfather was more doing crochet they all doing crochet too, but uh, these things. And she, she told me, ah, you gotta buy a jersey. And gave me the name of a shop. I went to the shop, I bought a jersey textile, and I tried to put this frame on it. You know, the frame has the wood, and the wood has this uh, part that I don't know how to say the name in English, that gets inside of our fingers and hurts, and it doesn't get in, and I get tired of that. Because there is this thing too, now. I think it, we do art, it, that should be something that don't make us tired, now. Uh, <laughs> because it, we are a slave of it, you know, you know uh, once I was with a friend of mine, and I think she's a very bureaucratic person on her speaking, and even a little bit on her work, even though I think it's very cool, her work, uh, but uh, she began to tell me about, uh, uh, she was doing some works with the the head, pictures of the head uh, of the guys, prisoners, uh, from the uh, the spin of the hair of the prisoners from Carandiru in Brazil, and pictures that are in a negative, made by glass. Her name is Rosângela Renan, uh, on glass. And, and she spent, and she, she called me to ask me something uh, to solve some problem of uh, sculpture or something like that, whatever, you know art but uh, she began to she began to tell she stayed like 40 minutes i lay down on the sofa and she was telling me the whole bureaucratic process that she was uh, 
uh, crossing to get the rights to, to, to work with that. And she was saying that is if, if in a way kind of complaining, but the reality, she was loving it. And she loves it, you know. And this is, this is the, the important thing. We are, we are uh, this is our love, you know, and that's where is our force, but also our fragility. You know, also our, uh, so uh, she is a uh, lot of love to you, Rosangela, to come here now in this moment. But uh, so you need to do something that is cool to do, né? because so it stop. But one day I went to a ballet to Nicolai, Alvin Nicolai, dance theater in the theater in Brazil. And, God, and the guy suddenly it began and people are laid down on the, on the stage. And then they begin to, they begin to make like that. <laughs> Stretching a textile around them. And, that, and I begin to say, cara, can't believe that. But the day after, I had become a very good student. I was studying a guy named Morricone, and I was studying in the classroom, was named Research in Calder. Technically, it was his uh, normal class, but begin with Research in Calder, you know, because every six months, new people, you need to make some new uh, charming thing to engage the people. But I began to do a lot of Calder toys, Calder figures, and this was very important to me. And also, I, I, art had brought me a girlfriend, you know, because I was not very good with the girls, you know. And we had, the, the year before, we had kind of something, a class that was a, something, urban intervention. And, and in the end of it, uh, by chance, I met a girl, and we began to fall in love, and all these good things of love. And her mother had a book named Calder's Universe. And Calder had been in Rio de Janeiro. I had Calder in my mind because I saw him there a child, you know. It was uh, kind of someone known in Brazil. And, and I have these uh, wires, a uh, wire made by aluminum that we use to make the sculptures Calder. There are a lot of immobiles I have done, you know, because I became a good student. The guy said, make this at home. I make 10 times 20 these and this thing began added on this thing. Uh, and then, uh, and then I was there, and I pick up a textile, I cut this textile as a triangle, I saw a pocket here, a pocket here, and a pocket in each corner. And I pick up uh, uh, the wire, I put it in this pocket here, I move it here, then I move it there, make I mean a round thing to make a base, and then it came back, the end to the beginning, to stretch it up. And it became something like that, you know, white, uh, which just looks like it was just a little leg going up, you know, like a ballerine, like a wing, uh, like a sail from a boat. And I spent the whole whole afternoon looking to that Sunday, and and then a lot of things begin to happen, begin to make some work. But the fact is that I like to stretch these things. You probably had realized now because the 30 years I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing uh, what I say is that I'm doing filling bags and making knots. That's what I do in my life. What do you do in your life? I, I fill bags and I make knots, you know. And that's how I move around. And have, uh, that's kind of a glass that we begin to see the world, you know. But also using the gravity. And I begin to use the gravity. And gravity, because when we use this situation, we are dealing with this naturality, the nature, the intimacy, the property of this matter. And the gravity is this connection né, to everything, it's this incredible uh, forces that puts everything together in a way, makes us spinning around the sun, something invisible, but super visible. Né? Everything falls down, né? and we are always falling. And, and gravity is incredible because in the science, gravity is the most visible force. Now we have a four force, a weak, strong, and electromagnetic. And these three ones, they understand quite clear. They put them together in this de desire to put, uh, to have one equation for everything. I don't know, to unify the force. You probably have heard about that. But gravity, they can't really. <laughs> find out. Uh, they talk about gravitons, I don't know, maybe there's somebody here who knows better than me, but uh, as far as I know, uh, you remember, I want to be an astronomer, so I, I keep studying a little bit this thing because I like it. Yeah. 
And so gravity, gravity God. And then uh, I begin to use it. And I begin to stretch some, some things getting out of the wall, you know, getting out using the architecture, using the floor, you know, uh, spreading out of the space, getting out of this uh, dimension of the sculpture. Uh, and, but, but this, this, uh, the, the, the things begin to rip, the, the, the finishing of it, the relation between the textile and the steel was kind of, you know, something, not, not, not like that. Uh, not poetically simple like a smile, not like and then I pick up a flat piece of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, like this, of uh, steel. And I made a hole here in the center. Oh, sorry, brother. And I made another one here. So you could connect it, this one to this one. And they keep together like that. Or you can put one here and the other one there, connected by this cord. Or you could put one here and the other there. Or you could put in the corner or in a, uh, on the tree. They both pending. And we could have many different situations of it. And I call this kind of equation A, B, A. Uh, the board, the string, the board. A, B, A. A, B, A was separating. And then uh, this time of A, B, A, I began to go to this guy by steel, you know, and I saw this big cranes carrying steel like this thick and this becoming so organic, it's so flexible, something that is so hard. And my God, discovering things like that. And really a little bit connected with this minimalist guy, I would say, <laughs> in this part, poverty people. And some guys from Brazil too, that I come to meet later, like Zé Rezende, Tunga, Walter Escalda, Cildo Meirelles, é, Barril, Arthur Barril. José Rezende, you mentioned. José Rezende, yeah. José Rezende was very important for me in that moment. But, uh, but uh, I don't know if exactly the moment I already knew his work, but, but the fact is that uh, on this situation of the just one knot crossing a hole, crossing the other hole, and the other knot holding the situation, this moment that we have just a knot holding all the energy that is going on there, this was for me uh, what I believe that was my first engagement of what would be, in my understanding, contemporary art. Because the, the, the language was <laughs> like that, not <laughs> it was clear what was going on. You know, you might like, you might dislike, it, but it was there, you know. And at this moment, I was living in my mother's home, and there was always a ball, uh, a racket ball, green, moving from here to there, from there to here, blah, blah. It's added for the dog, you know, dog, uh, ball. And I was always looking to this ball. And I went to this shop, this big thing, far away from, from where I lived, in Rio de Janeiro. Not so far, but anyway. Uh, more heavy duty stuff. Uh, and I saw a bar a bar, a square bar of steel. And I looked to that and I, I felt in love with that. It was like this, this big, this big, and I got it. And when I arrived home, you remember that ball that was moving everywhere? Suddenly, <laughs> <laughs> stop, baby, don't move anymore. You're moving too much. Stay here, keep quiet, let's stay together. And then this bar stay together with this ball, you know. And the bar smash the ball a little bit. The air inside holds the, the rubber. And this moment of touch was, I, I, I felt in love with that. And then one day later, with, uh, 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 I pick up that and I put on the, on the wall here. Wall, moor, uh, was here. We put the ball here, we put the bar here, and it hold each other. And if you put in different positions the ball, the deformation was different. And in that time, uh, I began to meet Zé Rezende. And uh, Tunga introduced me to Zé Rezende. 
and I was I even crashed the car before meeting him. So excited I was. <laughs> In São Paulo, Altunga was installing big hair sculpture with uh, a head of him cut it here, hanging all the way up, and a drawing of a woman ending up in a dog made by magnetics without the head. Very cool work. <laughs> and I was helping him to do that. And it's great that we can have this conversation, you know, on the 30th anniversary of also your first exhibition and all these works you've been describing. And of course, um, you mentioned gravity, you know, we feel it, it's a field, we have this planet here, it's the gravity field. And at a certain moment, you, you actually started to amplify this field. And one of the first moments I came across your work was in the late 90s, early 2000s. For example, one show was in Stockholm, I saw in 2000 the show at Magazine 3, when you then brought in smell. Uh, and Margaret Mead always says, you know, the, the anthropologist, she said that in the 50s, that on average, people spend very little time in front of artworks. Uh, the ritual of the exhibition is a very free ritual because we can really choose how much time we spend in front of artworks. It's, you know, it's not an appointment like the opera or the theater. It's a very free ritual. But she's so, so in a way, this freedom is the advantage. But Margaret Mead says the disadvantage is that people just you know, pass by and often don't spend time. And she sort of analyzed why this could be the case and says that it might have to do with the fact that there is a certain detachment from the senses because it only appeals to the visual sense. So she said we should start to think about all the other you know, senses which uh, the medium of the exhibition could relate to. So for me, reading that at the time, I was amazed to all of a sudden find that sense of smell in, in your exhibitions. Can you talk a little bit about how that arrived? Because I think the spice and the smell, it arrived before Stockholm, it arrived in the mid-90s, but it then became a very important part of your rituals. Uh, who said that to you? Margaret, I read it. In the 50s, Margaret Mead wrote Margaret this text, Mead. Yeah, the anthropologist. Th that's very great, because uh, beyond the question of the smell, uh, when I begin to do the naves and the evolution of the naves in this environment place, uh, what I begin, th th my desire was the people to lose them time, to create a space for people to be, you know, because we are always running from here to there, and and if we, yeah, that was my. But anyway, back to the to the spice thing. Uh, Oh, I have done this, these sculptures, né, the lead, the colonies, né, that you, we, we jump a little bit, just after the bar ball, because I did this exhibition of the bar ball, mm -hmm. the bars is smashing on the wall. Zen Hezend get very upset with me because there was just the bar ball there. And he would say, but where is the other things, blah, blah, blah. And he gave me a, uh, like, blah, 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 you know, uh, father. And, uh, I don't know what to say when you make a, when you speak uh, angry with the others. Yeah, make a bronca. Pega uma bronca nele. Bronca. Alguém fala português aí? Como é que é dar uma bronca? Call attention. Call attention must be. <laughs> Call attention wins. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but uh, then uh, in the moment uh, uh, there was this situation that I wanted to do a sculpture that we had a skin. You know, uh, because of the little ball of the bar ball, I begin to think about the situation of the skin of rubber and the air inside, because in the end, it was the air who was holding the everything. <sighs> this air, and it's interesting, I never thought about that, because this air is going to be very important for the whole development of the naves. That uh, is really something very important that had happened many years later. But uh, and in between the naves, the bar ball, the, the colony, spice and the, na the naves, that is the spice. But uh, I want to do this sculpture of the skin and with cells. And for this exhibition of the barbell, there was a mezzanine. And on this mezzanine, I wanted to put a, a stretch a textile and put a bar floating on it. But when I begin to make tests of it in my studio with a square bar like the ones I described here, I begin to see that the bar hurts too much the textile. And, and there is tension on the work. There is always tension. But the tension should be something with love. Now, there's no love without tension. Tension, we need tension. You need tension to uh, our, our own body. Now, you need to exercise. You need tension. 
but not you know, being smashed by the tension, you know, kill the other, this is too much. You know? And that's what was the situation there. So I wanted to put little balls, balls of lead. And then a friend of mine, great artist named Franklin Cassaro, said, you know, man, these little balls, that is this lead for shutting gun uh, in, the, in the Sahara. And I went there, and I met these guys, you know, setting kind of hunting guns, hunting guys. And I bought this little bit of lead, the two little packs, two packs that they made, because normally they send 100 grams, and they sold 200 grams pack with uh, uh, type like that. So I put them together like that, and I make a string in between, like this ABA system. And I put them together, so I need to go back there to buy again to do something, because this one was already done, and I wouldn't open that here at all to do, to do anything. I don't know where is it, disappear, because I'm not good the collector of the works of the others, and even less of the work of myself. So a lot of things had disappeared, uh, because it's like that, you know? But anyway. Uh, so thanks for all the collectors, galleries, museums, institutions who can help uh, me and the other artists to collect because re collecting our own work is really kind of boring. Uh, but sometimes we need to save some things to tell the story. But uh, anyway, thanks a lot. But uh, but uh, and then I get this thing and I I put in the plastic. I put in the condoms. It's very cool to put in the condoms too. You know, it stay like a little warm like a little animal you know with this nose <laughs> fl uh, fluffy like that because it's quite heavy you know so it's, it's like a yeah, uh, yeah, the snail maybe something like that but it really uh, life's very short now yeah, because can condos very quick you get dry and, <laughs> and everything falls down you know all the beads you know and you cannot pick up with uh, magnets because it's made by lead so you need to really take care of it but uh, but suddenly, like six months later, one day I, 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 I have the idea. I was in the studio, Epiphany. And then I said, socks, I can put in a socks. And I pick up a socks of mine and I put that and I begin to play that on the floor. And I couldn't believe what was going on. Then I went home, I was leaving my mother's home. So I pick up my mother's leg. So you see Freud, yeah, who knows? <laughs> but the first one was my mother's leg. <laughs> And I did that, you know, forgive, you know, I cut here, make the lot, turn inside out, cut there, roll it, and whew, feel, and pa. That's the born of the seed of everything. So barbell was the piece that pushed me to be who I am now. Barbell was the whole connection with concrete, neoconcretism, and all these things about uh, Brazilian art. Of course, the this seed particle weight, it's also connected with uh, Ligia Clark, Tunga, especially these two of them, but I think all of them, uh, Zé Rezende, Amilcar de Castro, Hélio, and everyone else, Barrio. But, uh, uh, and then the colonies came normally. No, you know, when I looked, so I had some sculptures there. Now, sculpture, sculpture is the one who makes sculpture. Now. So I was there making sculpture, now, spending my time. That's what I like to do. Now. Some people like to surf. Some people like now, to dance. Some people like to climb trees. Some people climb mountains. Some people make sculpture. <laughs> kind of, some people think it's idiot the ones who make sculpture. Maybe they are right because you stay there making sculpture. But I like it. And then, yeah. I had some sculpture there. <laughs> Looks like you go on the art fair and you see the sculpture. It's so weird for me, you know. I had to say to you, now, do you see it? The art is there. That. <laughs> and people, look. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and the art. <laughs> Here I am. It's, it's, it's weird, you know, uh, uh, for me. But, you know, it's great because you see great stuff you know, when you, you begin to get a little bit. Uh, yeah, uh, now, okay, let's see the art, and then whew, uh, it takes a little bit of a while for me to be able to uh, see the art. But it's fun too because we met so many people. But uh, I saw good stuff today there. But uh, <coughs> uh, I was in this situation, so I had made this sculpture. Now I had made it at home. Now I had picked up the stockings at home and made it, because I didn't have the lead there. I don't remember, but I had the piece in, in the little studio that I had. And all the other sculptures there, now, like. Maybe me, maybe you now. <laughs> they are there with you too, because 
you gotta take care of them. If you don't take care of them, there is this book from uh, Heidegger, isn't it? Now, who is the artist? The artist or is the creator? Or is the guy who take care, who make the art become the art? Yeah, because if nobody take care, disappear. Because you know, I'm as an artist, I'm not gonna take care. But anyway, they are there. Take care of me. Take care of me. And there was this little sculpture that, like this big and the other ones, a little bit more big, a little bit more formal, a little bit more normal, I would say. And this little one there, you know, roll the fin, the let the stock, the let the stock, and little one. And you know, I begin to feel, well, of course, that uh, in, in one week there's nobody else there, just her there and some friends of her, some brothers and sisters of her that begin to grow around, you know. But uh, everything else disappeared because the force of her was very strong. But, but she, at the same time, was very weird in relation to everything else, uh, in relation to the history in myself. But I feel that uh, sometimes when you fall in love, you know, and your girlfriend is a little bit different than your friends, than, than your friends, and, you know, you get a little bit shy because you're so in love. And this kind of thing, the nose maybe is like that, <laughs> the hair just should be like that, but then you see you cannot think about anything else, you know, besides her, you know, and then that's what had happened. And that's uh, the colony. <coughs> and then, after that, yeah, many colony, a lot of things that had done, that uh, jump polypes and whatever. Then there are many exhibitions, that it's kind yeah. of fascinating because we have to jump in time because I promise this would not be a marathon. And the great thing is, you know, that we, we have now heard from you about all these epiphanies where you found your language. And then, you know, you started to do bigger and bigger shows. It is, you know, exhibitions uh, like uh, the Pantheon in Paris or exhibitions where you really started to also do retrospectives and surveys. And then something happened, which uh, I wanted to talk about before we then talk about the piece, which is soon going to open in in Zurich, which is the Bayerl project in Zurich, uh, and it's the piece immediately before, and it's very connected, so I thought it would be interesting, and you said before that that was an epiphany, and it's this project about the sacred, the sacred secret, which is basically a project at TBA 21 with Francesca von Habsburg in, um, in Vienna. Uh, it's very connected to this idea also of the exhibition as a, as a ritual, and you worked there together with the spiritual leaders of the Huni Kuin uh, uh, community, with the group. And I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about how that began and uh, how you kind of connected to their you know, memory, their legacy, how you brought it into the present. Uh, and yeah, to tell us more about this epiphany of the sacred you, you had about two years ago. So from this seed, uh, which is this this uh, for lead uh, was very interesting because I go to these shops with women's shop, yeah, stockings, and I begin to ask a lot of things, buy a lot of stockings, and I know stockings, every shop in Rio de Janeiro, wh which colors they have. Uh, and I go to these macho shops to buy five kilos of lead, 10 kilos of lead. Bege I begin to buy in the company, but they don't know why you this guy is buying so much lead. So there was this contrast, masculine and feminine. And then a lot of things happened. And one day I was moving around with a friend of mine. She wants to go to a sh uh, wants to buy something. And I took her to an Arabian shop. And I got impregnated by the spices, colors, and smell. And I brought it home to be very quick. It makes me... But some, bought some curcuma. A week after, I couldn't stand the smell of the curcuma anymore. And then I bought clove and pepper, and I make like this, put it in the stockings, and it uh, it balanced. But it's still something that uh, every time that I carry, you know, I get totally dirty. And eight months later, one day I pick up by the mouth and I let it fall down, like you can see here. And when I let it fall down. I could take it again by the mouth, putting it another place, falling down, falling down. So it be, it find it it understand it being it identity or whatever you wanna call it being. So it's interesting what you said about because the smell is something that uh, my work has this relation to touch because it's very touchable, it's very relational, and uh, the smell touches yourself. And maybe because this smell begin to create an uh, uh, environment on the air, that I had arrived in the naves, you know. Because the naves is, is exactly the opposite. Uh, these pieces, you have high density, high excitement, 
by the colors, by the smell, and a spot here generating this atmospherical smell around. And the nave now is something open like that, that you have the atmosphere filtering the atmosphere inside and outside, and very ethereal, very light. And so this, this uh, situation of these two works, because I begin to balance in between them, begin to create this uh, idea of environment, idea of place to be, and place to be together. And all the time, my work was this relation to nature. How I could uh, find nature in the amoebal spirit, on the microbes, on the cells, uh, the idea of life, always thinking about life. Because my, my, my feeling was that uh, we think too much about death, you know. Uh, and we don't think very much about life, the joy of life, the beauty of see all these leaves falling down, to feel the breeze, to feel the air inside, <sighs> to be. And at this moment, also, we had begin to do parties, uh, New Year's Eve party on the beach with uh, different friends from different areas, not just people from the art scene, people from every different scene. You know, I think we found each other on the beach. And we begin to stay on the beach. And beach, you have the sea, you have the water. You know, the sea, when you are inside of the sea, you are immersed. When, when, you, when you get inside of the navy, the spirit of it, you, ha you are immersed in it. We are always immersed on everything. <sighs> the air is out, in, out, in. So uh, we are inside of it. And this uh, atmospherical thing from the spies, from the navy, was uh, uh, driving my my life, and the color came out to my work. I remember I came back from Europe, I guess, from exhibition. I, my work was more uh, off white, more clouds, you know, more dream. And suddenly I looked to the people. I said, you know, we have colors. What, uh, what I am? And then the colors begin to get in the in the naves, first pink and green, the flesh and the the vegetables or the, uh, the complementary colors, Egon Chile, and all these things. And then, so I was exploring this environment uh, of nature, how to be, how nature get out of us, how is the continuity from our body to the territory, our body to the mountains, how a mountain, a sculpture, for example, the one from the uh, Park Avenue, uh, Anthropogeno, you would see it like an animal, but at the same time as a mountain, you know? How our body, that is this story of the guy that is bi-dimensional, that he begin to just square triangles and circles, you know? This, sorry, I don't remember. Para, para, para plexus, I don't know. You mean the show at the armory, the Park Avenue armory? No, I was talking about the armory. I'm not I'm talking about uh, anything of this, but the dimension, for example. If, if there is a a little uh, ant walking on you, uh, the little ant, she is here and she begins to walk on you, she wouldn't feel the difference that you are a, a, a body, an animal, or a land. Maybe the land is also an animal now. That is the situation, this transition. What is our relation to this earth? What is to be here? To eat the plants, to eat the meat. Now, our continuity, the fruits that we are from this planet, you know, and also all this cultural environment. I begin to think about the relation. What's the difference between Brazil and, and Europe, for example, or US? Oh, it's a question between the figure and the background. I went to Mexico. Mexico made me crazy. The naves appear after, after Mexico. I stay a week off, not talking telephone with anybody. The day I arrived, after some things, suddenly I begin to throw out a white stuff that looks like puka, but I had drink puka like two days before, or three. So I don't know what was that. But the day after, the nave, all the spirit of the nave began to come to me. I began to draw the naves. I began to theorize everything, conceptualize all the organoids, elements of the naves and everything. I went out I, uh, to uh, this, this place with many shops of textiles, and I, and I bumped to the textile. Big, we don't even exist this textile anymore. Two meters uh, high, the color I wanted, this kind of cream, and you stretch that to six meters. You know, it was amazing, this textile, from advance. But, uh, uh, and, and, I, and I begin, you know, it was something like that, because I met these Omeka sculptures. And these Omeka sculptures, they are sculptures that uh, 
uh, uh, big heads, you know, and Aztecas, all, everything there. But for example, these guys, archaeologists, they are working in Yucatan, found a bush, begin to take the bush out, big head. <laughs> found a, 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 a mountain, begin to take out, pyramid, you know. And then I begin to think about that because this sculpture looks like the stone was more heavy than, than the stone. They want to be a stone in a way for me. That's how I felt the first thing. And I begin to compare to the Greek sculptures and the Egyptians. That is kind of our formation. You know, our, I receive, we in Brazil, I don't know if you know, but we, we, they teach us that we are Westerns, you know. Sorry to say about that to you, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to come back to that, okay? And so we study it. And we don't study Mexican sculpture, we study uh, uh, Greek and Egyptian sculptures. And I begin to think about this relation between the figure and the background. You know, desert in, in, in Egypt. You know, not so many trees like here in, in Greece, maybe like a little bit more, but a lot of rocks and sea. So the relation between the figure and the background, a lot of emptiness. And it generates a philosophy of the emptiness that had been emphasized on the, on the Renaissance with the perspective. What's the idea of the space? The idea of space, we say space, we say the void, we feel the void, because that was the education that we had through the Illuminism and everything. And it began to, to change my, because I always was thinking about uh, uh, symbiosis. Symbiosis was something very strong, because in Brazil, a tree like that, it would be many other trees together with that. That's very normal in tropical countries. And we are very used to that. And the way we live, Rio de Janeiro is compressed. Compressed by the mountain, compressed. It's like a river, you know? We are compressed. So things are like that. It's busy, you know? We are compressed. And then I begin to think about these things. Then I read the text from Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, talk about that the indigenous, they say the world is too much populated. And it bumped to the relation that I had, the difference between Brazil and there is the, the relation between the figure and the background. Because here, the, there is the figure and there is the background. And it's very clear, the line in between the figure and the background. In Brazil, you know, the relation between the figure and the background, there's a forest there. I was used to say that before I go to the forest, because there is a forest in Rio de Janeiro. Everything can happen. Even, for example, the bus is stopped on the red light. You bump, you knock the door, the guy opens the door, you go up. And this is kind of obvious for us, but it doesn't happen here. If you knock the door here to the bus, the guy says, say, what do you want? You want information? Not going to think that you want to climb on the bus, because that is the point, the right place to pick up the bus. And this is pretty good, too, you know, I mean, and I'm not, it's not comparative. But there is this difference. And I thought it was just a relation between the figure and the background. And then the guy said that the world for the indigenous, is too much populated. And it bumped to this situation that the relationship between the figure and the background in Brazil is there's a lot of things going on. The excess of life there is enormous. Architecture, they had problems because you built a wall here, and then a tree begin to grow, destroy the walls. Ants begin to grow everywhere, you know. There is an excess of nature. It's too much life. Life, 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 life. And, and, and I'm thinking about life now, all these things. And I was in Sashia. When the uh, live in like, Calder Studio, a wonderful time I had there, uh, with my friend Elodie Casi, with my friend uh, Frank Leibovici, uh, my good friends from, from, from Paris that I met through my life, and my family. And suddenly I received uh, some, a report about the uh, student from Finland. <laughs> Fifth question, how do you feel? How do you feel exhibiting in the West? I feel not well. At home, am I not Western? Then I begin to have a doubt. Maybe I'm not Western. <laughs> I begin to ask everybody, and everybody begins to say, no, oh, brother, you are not Western. <laughs> Take it easy, my friend. We are the Western. You, I don't know. And this was great for me, you know, because it was a relief, you know. I say, fantastic, I'm not a Western. This is great, you know. I don't need to carry all these problems and have to answer all these questions because I'm not a Western. And, and they were absolute truth, you know, because in Brazil, the first Brazilian is son of an indigenous woman for many years. And the second son or daughter or whatever uh, generation of Brazilians, they are son of African woman. And it took time for the, for the European women to come to Brazil. So we are absolutely miscegenated. Uh, miscegenated makes sense? 
mixed uh, people, you know. That's what we are. And this is not the West. Uh, yeah, Eduard Lissan talks about creolization. Creolization. Talk about creolization uh, no? And then, uh, mm. the creolization, I met a guy named Mario Lucio. He's a, a composer and a singer from Cabo Verde. This guy is very enlightened. This guy is quite ahead. And at least in relation to me. Né? <laughs> but I believe in relation to many people. And he talks about creolization. Because the creole is the mix. They say that he, uh, in his land, Cabo Verde, when they, they become independent, they have a choice. Or should they kill all the white people, or should the white people kill all the black people? <laughs> And then they begin to realize that they had, some black people had kids with some white people, some white people had kids with some black people, and they said, you know, let's give up about this thing of killing each other, and let's have a good life together. <laughs> and it looks like the I chief tried to, to learn with them, and Nelson Mandela talked with them before become the president to try to, 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 to build democracy in this Creole uh, spirit, with the spirit of the miscegenation. And I had a, always feeling that Brazil could give a lot to the world because of the miscegenation in Brazil. But Brazil is such a mess with this miscegenation that I don't know, you know, but maybe one day uh, we're going to uh, be able to give something because I think there's no, no way out. We're going to be mixed, everyone. And this is great because we're all human beings, we're all brothers. As Mario Lúcio say, we all came from Africa, you know. It doesn't matter the color of our skin. And there is love inside of us. And love is eternal. There is one thing that is very important to me, that uh, we, uh, when I did the piece, uh, uh, the o bicho suspenso na paisagem, the animal suspend in the landscape in Argentina, it also had been shown in Rio de Janeiro in a train station, uh, came a sentence to me. Culture separate us, nature unifies us. Culture separate us, uh, nature unifies. This is not against culture, but culture at the same time make us understand the other better. But because of culture, you say, oh, you are different than me, and multiculturalism. Ah. Uh, the Swiss people, they are different than Brazilians. Yeah, uh, we all know that. No? <laughs> but uh, Brazilians from Sao Paulo is different from Brazilians from Rio de Janeiro. Yeah, but Brazilians from Rio de Janeiro, from North Zone, is different from Brazilians from South Zone. Brazilians from South Zone at Flamengo is different from the uh, Brazilians, so Cariocas, from uh, Ipanema. And Cariocas from Ipanema who goes to the beach here is different than the ones who go to the beach here. And then with this multiculturalism, we, are, we arrive in the singularity of each one of us. And then the art critics, they cannot make a text about the group of the artists. They go to make interviews with the people. And you see how interview became the key thing for our generation of the art. Because the multiculturalism came from a, an idea to understand the, the, the periphery became the center point of the development of the art in the center. Uh, isn't it an interesting thing? And that's things that I've been thinking uh, of this way, going here and there. And with this situation that I was uh, in this universe that I'm trying to say to you, uh, I was used to say like that, we are in this table having a beer, you know, great discussion, transforming things, revolution, and magnetized by the culture, we can't get out of the table. Pa, 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 pa. But a voice comes to you and say, brother, stand up. Hey, Ernesto, stand up. Say, no, no, take this, take this. You can't wait, but at some point, and you there, you can't get out, because this magnetism is so strong, until you can, doof, you get out. <laughs> and then you stand up, and you begin to move, and you get so introspective, <laughs> centered in yourself, connected, breathing, and you begin to move, and you walk until the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and you arrive there, and you pee. And then you receive all this force, cosmic force, you feel the infinite inside of you. 
you come with new ideas because you got connected to nature. Nature, that inside of us, we are nature. And we are always separating culture from nature, but we are nature. And this moment is the moment of uh, transcendence. And the voice that was talking to you and saying, Ernesto, let's get up, brother. You can't stay there anymore, let's get up. It was nature talking to us. So nature is the same to all of us. Doesn't matter if you are rich, poor, black, white, fat, thin, man, woman, uh, Brazilian, Swiss, Japanese, uh, Nairobian. Uh, if, if your son fall down, hurt his head, die, you're going to have the same feeling. And this is very important for us to understand that we are, we are just one humanity. And this humanity, what I learned with the indigenous people, because at some point a friend of mine said to me, you need to meet the, the shamans. And two years later I went with her and I had one of the most incredible moments of my life. A ceremony uh, where everybody was sitting down on the ring, men's here, I was less man than she was here, women there, children, girls and boys there around the candle, in the middle of the forest, Amazonic forest, I was in the hammock, because we would do a ceremony where we would drink a very strong medicine, sacred medicine for them, the Bible for them, the Alcoran for them, the Torah for them. That's the medicine. When they drink that medicine, they read the Bible, they talk with God, the spirit of the forest, the spirit of the planet, the spirit of Gaia, if you want to say. And and there was just the birds singing. The birds know the crickets. The night, the candle moving. And and we drink that one by one. It was very spiritual already, very silent. And suddenly they begin to sing. And I couldn't believe uh, what I was hearing. I have never heard something like that in my life. And, and suddenly the force began to come. I began to see many things, especially my family, my friends, people, people in general. A huge love in between people. We went more deeply on the forest three days after, and when I had the, we had a ritual much smaller, and when I, the force came, suddenly I felt myself inside of a plant, inside of a leaf, understanding all the organicity of it. And in that moment, everything I had studied, all the education I had had, all the art I have done, all my devotion to life, to try to understand life, humble in a way, sometimes might be, I had might be arrogant, some days, probably, but if he, all my heart, I saw all my life there as an artist, the art, the science, and this dimension of the sacredness, the trees, the leaves. And this was something very strong for me that uh, made me uh, begin a kind of transformation in myself. I don't believe in evolution anymore. I think the time we live is the time for transformation, transformation of our self, of our spirit, of our conscience to, to the beauty that is to be alive to the beauty to hear this little noise so far away of this airplane while this bird is singing, while, while the light is brightening around. And also to question, it's so much beauty, it's so much joy, why there is so much pain and punishment? Yeah. Why uh, we cannot live uh, in more uh, harmonic way. I had been thinking about 
there is a lot of injustice, 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 yeah. injustice in the world. And another day, I begin to realize that when you say injustice, you think about jail, you think about uh, uh, guilty, and you think about things that are so bad. And I begin to feel that maybe we can talk about why we are so unbalanced. Yeah? That uh, we need more balance in the world. When we say justice, we need more balance, more harmony. Because then we go more in a positive way. How are we going to do that? I don't really know, you know. But uh, uh, it had opened a huge dimension of spirituality on myself. I always felt my work uh, in a spiritual dimension. I always, when I was doing my work, I was thinking about the infinity. This thing that I said of integrity, of be clear, transparent, what's going on there, not have something hidden here. That's why it's difficult for me to plug a sculpture. I'm not saying that I'm against plugged art, you know. I'm just saying that for me it's difficult to make plugged. Uh, uh, when I say this integrity, by, because of my inheritance of this dictatorship and everything, but also because we're talking about with the great spirit, you know, the infinity, God, whatever you want to call. It's seeing everything. I can hide things from all of you. Easy. <laughs> but I cannot hide from myself. And all of you can hide it from any one of us. It's easy to hide the others. But it's difficult to hide from ourselves, unfortunately, because sometimes it would be good. But <laughs> we can't, so we need to, to deal with that. And, and this dimension of spirituality, this understanding that everything is sacredness, that our, our life is sacred. Other, I was used to say, brother, you know, we have to trust life. We had to live. Because, you know, there was millions of spermatozoids running for that egg. And we, all of us, we arrived there. We got in. And all the other ones, they had dig. They had work a lot for one of us get in. We need all of us. You, you can imagine, we are all, uh, everybody together, okay? <laughs> let's, let's have this fantasy. We are all together, there is an egg here. And we know that all of us need to dig, but just one of us, one of us, gonna get in. And uh, we don't know who is gonna be this person. But this person who get in there is going to be representing all of us. So we have a lot of brothers and sisters who stay on the way and we represent a collective. You know, our body is made by three trillions of cells with our DNA. DNA Neto, DNA Hans, DNA Judith, DNA Elodie, DNA everyone. But one quadrillion, what's much more, of cells with foreigner DNA. We are much more a foreigner than ourselves mostly bacteria. We cannot live without them. So we are a collective. And this collective is in our birth, you know. And, and this, you know, you know when I heard that for the first time, that uh, the, the, the saudade, the missing of the, the brothers from the fecundation, in a, in a LP named Sal Sem Carne from Sildo Meirelles. Yeah, Sildo. You know, he, he said that you know, he met a long time ago. <laughs> no, enlightened man. But uh, now this is actually the perfect transition to talk about to, to come to my next question. But before that, we should give a big applause for Ernesto Neto. Thank you, everybody. A big applause, and it's kind of interesting also because when you talk about you know this whole aspect of of healing and uh, you know uh, your your kind of experiences also with the Huni Queen we discussed last night. You said they may be actually avant-gardists of our time. And there is this book, the Book of Healing, um, which has to do with plants, not with healing plants. I mean, maybe I actually think a lot of uh, Emma Kuhn's. Have you ever been to the Emma Kuhn's Museum in Switzerland? Uh -huh. You need to go there very urgently because it's between Basel and, and Zurich. It's near Aarau. Uh, and it's this amazing healer uh, from Switzerland who developed the spiritual abstraction 
uh, because she discovered a rock, uh, you know, which is basically, which has healing qualities. And she then, with the pendulum, made these amazing drawings of a spiritual abstraction. Uh, and she also developed this product called Ion, where this healing quality of the rock can be, you know, applied. It exists as, you know, uh, it's applicable for humans, but it's also applicable for plants. There is a, you know, an ion for plants. So when you put it in the earth, the plants grow much, you know, faster. And there is a museum and has a lot to do with, you know, what you talk about, about healing. But you also talked about Gaia. Um, and Gaia brings us to, you know, the piece which is going to inaugurate in Zurich uh, with uh, the Foundation Bayra, the Gaia Model Tree. It's basically uh, one of your biggest uh, pieces so far. And it's fascinating that you, you called it Gaia because I went a couple of um, months ago to visit James Lovelock. Uh, as part of my, you know, uh, uh, basically uh, visiting very, very old pioneers. I mean, we started with Albert Hoffman, the interview about LSD. And in the meanwhile, I've got about a hundred of such interviews. We, of course, did Oscar Niemeyer in, um, uh, in Rio. Uh, about that, we're going to talk at the very end, because he drew in the air, and you're going to draw. Because this is only the beginning. I know that we have to wrap up soon, but we will have to talk about the piece in Zurich, and then Ernesto will do a more performative part with cherries. So this is, we're going to have three parts of this interview. We've now entered part two. Part two is to talk about the Gaia you know, Model 3. And James Lovelock uh, established this Gaia hypothesis. He's in his mid-90s, lives in Chesil Beach in England. And it's the hypothesis that the living and the non-living parts of the Earth form a complex interacting system that can be thought of as a, you know, as a single as a single organism. And what is so fascinating is that uh, according to this uh, uh, Gaia hypothesis, the planet in all its part remains in suitable condition for life thanks to the behavior and action of living organism. And once this equilibrium is, you know, basically destroyed, uh, the conditions of life are destroyed. And James Lovelock is an inventor who his entire life was independent of institution, has this amazing, you know, curiosity. Uh, and when actually he discovered this Gaia, you know, theory, he didn't have a name for it. And then his neighbor, the, uh, the novelist William Golding, told him he should call it Gaia. Uh, but you found the name not through William Golding. You didn't find the name through James Lovelock, but it has something to do with your son. So I wanted to ask us to tell us about the genesis of this piece for Zurich, uh, how you came about it, and the role your son played in it. It's interesting the name of uh, James. James Lovelock. <laughs> he has love in his name and he has luck in his name. And he found, uh, developed the Gaia theory. I never read, you know. But uh, what he did, it brought this name, this Chitan of the Earth, from the Greek, not through his neighbor, to uh, naming the spirit of Gaia, which is the spirit of the Earth, uh, the spirit of nature, the spirit of life, in my understanding. So I was, uh, I had been invited by some, uh, since many years, some has been thinking, hey, I need to, I want to do something, if you want, we need to do an intervention somewhere. I'm looking for a place to do intervention. He invited me to swim on the river. <laughs> I put my, my clothes in this bag. This is so fantastic here. Jump on the Rhine here and get out over there. And he keep putting me to swim and talking to me. And I just listening to him. And he talking to me. And show me a bridge, show me some plants. Look at this place there. And suddenly, some years later, he came to me. Hey, what do you think about the Zurich train station? I say, cool, great. Let's go there. And we went there together with Mikiko. And they showed me, uh, here we are. And I say, great. And then we sit down, and I pick up a piece of paper, and I begin to draw the piece, because the piece came right away, uh, the basic of it, which is more or less like this. Hello? So, 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 uh, it grows like this as a tree, in my humble vision, uh, because <laughs> a tree is a little bit more advanced than us. Uh, that's why they don't speak. I don't know if you guys know that. The trees don't speak they do, because they did, don't need to show off. 
<laughs> no, they are fine. They know everything. <laughs> Since ages. They are here. <laughs> Such a long time. They clean all this atmosphere. Say, okay, let's have the animals now. Bah. And then arrive the animals. Oh, maybe, maybe the boa came there yeah, and gave the light for human being because we have, it's the boa who gives the light. Yeah. You know, Adam and Eva, they were yeah, in heaven, yeah, there. Adam, Eva, heaven, heaven no, yeah. paradise. Yeah. <laughs> heaven is after, yeah. paradise is before. <laughs> they were there in the paradise, Adam, Eva, and all the plants for sure, yeah. and the animals and everybody. And then, the serpent came and said to Eva, Eva, share the apple. Share the apple with Adam. This is good. And, and uh, Eva said, are you sure? Yeah, very good. Mm. And then Eva came. Adam, Adam. Hi, Adam. <laughs> Hi, Adam. You're looking mm, so strong today. No? And I don't know how was it. Nah, maybe, maybe Judith can tell me or Elodie, because I don't know. No, I am Adam, I'm not even at my mouth. <laughs> but I don't know how was that, but they shared the apple now. Nah? And we are here now. Nah? <laughs> Thanks to the boa, to the serpent, to the apple, to the fruit of the knowledge, that we are here nah? in between peace and war. We are alive now, nah? running to that egg, to one more coming, that is babies. <laughs> Coming every day, né? and people make love every day. Né? Every day, Adam, Eva, love. Adam, Eva, love. Né? And we here dancing. What are we going to do? Uh, with the peace in, uh, in, in Zurich, <laughs> with the peace in Zurich, and he connects, and he connects beautifully. You're going you're gonna to actually invite everyone to eat a fruit, you know, because it has to do with these seeds. Uh, and if I understand well, the drawing you made in the air, and it's very beautiful to see you draw in the air, because, you know, I often visited Oskar Niemeyer, and whenever one would visit Oskar Niemeyer, he would draw on these big pieces of paper, and the assistants would tear down the paper, and then the next paper, and the next paper. And we went to see him uh, last time when he was 103, and you know what? He had stopped drawing on paper. He would draw in the air, like you now did. And if I understand well, if I read well your drawing in the air, then... The, the, the center of this piece, in a way, the, 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 the very epicenter of this piece are these seeds. And uh, it's, it's many, many seeds. And it's also, it connects back to what you said before about mixity, you know, about creolization, because it's very much about uh, lots of different seeds. They will, they will form a counterweight. Uh, and your idea is actually to, uh, that everyone, you know, eats the fruit and then puts a part of themselves in, into the piece. And I think after your performance of drawing in the air, the idea was that here we all kind of participate in your piece for Zurich. Can you somehow tell us how we're going to do that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> thank you very much for... Oh, by the way, thank you very much for everything. Thank it's you a very pleasure much. to all of you to be here. <laughs> and I would like to thank you very much. Thank you to Hans. Very much thank you to Sonia, who has the crazy idea to invite me. <laughs> to be here. <laughs> Thank you to my mother, my father, né, my brothers and sisters, of course, <laughs> God. Uh, but thank you also to Isabella, who are really a uh, warrior here with us. Thank you to Marcia, who is here, Ethan, Elodie, my great sister, Elba, and maybe some people that I forgot. But I also thank you to Mikiko, and also to Angelica, and also to everybody here at the Bailey. Bailer, Bailer. Is Bailer or is Bailer? I never Bailer. know. Bailer? No, it's the Bailer. <laughs> and it's a really beautiful museum. I had been in the Museum National Sculptural Center also from Renzo Piano to in, in I did, did a piece there in Dallas. Really great. If you guys go there to Dallas, don't forget to go to Nasher. It's the best thing in town, I believe. But anyway, they built a building, very built building beside it with glasses. So the sun, there is a kind of uh, egg uh, box, egg, whatever made the eggs, that makes the, the light get in just in certain way to protect the art. But because of the building now, the, the sun is hitting the building and 
crossing the egg or whatever because the sun was not supposed to come this way. Now. <laughs> but he, that's the problem of human being. We try to, no, no, nature is great, but let's make a difference. Now. <laughs> Sometimes it <laughs> becomes some problems. Now. We had a big problem in Brazil, Mariana, Maria fell down, a lot of tragedy, you know. We need to be careful. But anyway, uh, so the sculpture is like that, as, as I was talking. And it, there is counterweights with spice here, stretch it up. And there is legs of, uh, with earth, stretching it down, uncovering it. In the center, there is a, a room. The entrance is the head of the boa. And I, I couldn't go very deep on why the boa is the father of us, but of course, if there was no boa and apple, we want them be here. But it goes beyond that. On the if we go to the Hunikui indigenous spirit, but the boa is everywhere, in the all the ancestor stories everywhere, you know, in the whole planet there is a boa. And also our DNA is two boas with the staircase. One day I can explain it better, but the guy who makes this theory, his name is Jeremy Narby, and he's going to be invited to have a talk there at the tree, because we want to have an assembly and a symposium and many events is going to happen there, because it's a place to be, a place to talk, a place to catch, sing, dance, chant. So there's going to be a carpet, cotton carpet, and in the center of it there is a kind of embroidery, a kind of technique of the carpet of little knots, very popular in Brazil, that makes a drawing of the planet Earth, uh, the view of the Atlantic, maybe South America, North America, Europe, and Africa, around. <coughs> and from the center of it, so it goes up like that to to help to hang it because you know this is gravity, now that's the game, you know. We need so uh, we are here, and I want all of you know with a lot of hope that we're gonna have a very good uh, hanging. Now, because we're dealing with uh, this force of God, now, and we are <coughs> mathematicians too, so we calculate everything, but you know, it's always tense this moment to hang the piece. But uh, it's going to be hanged like that, with this stretching down, and also there is some counterweight that goes to the center here, and there is a textile, a kind of a, a crochet, a kind of uh, flower, and a kind of uh, a stigma in a opposite way that comes down and that would be the curve of the piece like he said I didn't understand he said curve I said oh heart no? but I like this word curve ah, it's cool curve because it looks like coração that we say in Portuguese <laughs> uh, in the center there's be this counterweight of this curve that he we wanted to do with leaves I want to do with leaves you know uh, also, the CD guy uh, that uh, uh, the uh, people are selling here, and I'm making some uh, publicity here for you guys, you know, <laughs> because they are uh, fighting to find the, uh, the uh, funds to uh, lift the baby. The uh, baby is expensive. Uh, the CD guy is with balls here, but the reality that was supposed to be with leaves. And then they said leaves is complicated because cross the border, all the blah, 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 blah. And I made with balls. But there's some of them with leaves there. So if any one of you got the one with the balls, take the balls out. The balls is a string ball. Take the balls out and put the leaves. Because the idea is that we sell with the balls and then we tell them. But with leaves is better, OK? <laughs> so we tried us to have the leaves here. But leaves is a problem. You know you cannot transport leaves. Can you imagine? Leaves is a problem. <laughs> it's crazy, right? <laughs> you can't transport leaves, you know. And leaves is a problem to have on the train station because leaves can pick up fire. You cannot fireproof the leaves. That's what the uh, the fire people, uh, the rules tell us. You so know, no leaves but cherries. Yeah, no, no. Uh, then I stayed uh, the whole year. Why, what are you gonna put in the place of the leaves? And then came this idea of the seeds. And then, uh, okay, we want to have seeds, many different kinds of seeds. Uh, the people here to buy the seeds, uh, not not transgenic seeds. Now uh, we said that we didn't want transgenic seeds. We are natural seeds. And uh, because there is a nightmare going on in the planet you now, all this transgenic thing, insecticida, you know, uh, poison f food that we are having, a lot of people getting sick. But anyway, we don't want to get into that thing now, but uh, it is important to know. Uh, okay, no, we want avocado seeds, for example, but we cannot buy avocado seeds. Oh, yes. Or maybe, maybe we begin to eat avocados. You know? And then when I arrive here, 
I got uh, some seeds to, to, thank you to Nadine, to, to Mikiko and Nadine. And then came this thing, you know, guys, we need to put the seeds there. Of course, we're going to buy seeds, you know, fava, beans, whatever. But uh, we're going to eat some avocados because we cannot buy avocado seeds. And when I arrived uh, three days ago here after we had this talk, there was a box of cherries. Is there, is there a box of cherries there? Can I pick up, please? So there was this box of cherries uh, because we had this idea uh, to, to encourage everyone to, to eat a fruit, any fruit, and pick up the seed because when you eat a fruit, this fruit gets inside of us and this fruit is part of that seed. So if we put that seed inside of the, the piece, we're gonna we're gonna have part of us, part internal part of us, or whatever uh, the spirit, the fantasy, the uh, the dream want to say, inside of the piece too. <coughs> and they uh, left this box, thanks, brother, inside uh, of my room with a card from from the belly. Of, uh, was it the card? It was Francis Bacon. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> the body, you know, what school? <laughs> so, I begin to eat seeds, and I arrive here with some seeds, and then, uh, and then we have this idea. So, anyone who want uh, to bring to Zurich some seeds, uh, we're gonna begin to install on the 24th. It's good to let dry on the sun. Some people said that it's good to wash too, because with the saliv. Uh, uh, they doesn't grow after because we want to give to the people the seeds after, after uh, one month. That's just a shot. This bicho, papum, begin end. So let's see what's gonna happen, and and in the end we would like to give seeds to anybody who went plant. One of these seeds who had been uh, living with, with us in meditation, singing, dancing, speaking, debating, sleeping. You know, it, it can be a good place to sleep. Some people had already, already, already received letters from people saying, well, Ernesto, thank you very much. Today is going to be the last day that I'm going to sleep in your art. Every day after lunch, I've been coming here to sleep. So you can sleep there in Zurich. You know, that place. <laughs> but anyway, so the box was full, but now there's not so many. But uh, you can circulate it, no? And you all, you all invited to, to, to have one, one seed. I, I, I have already some. Seeds in my pocket, so I'm gonna. I don't know. We give to someone, organization. That's <laughs> where should they put the seed? Yeah, put here. Put here on the on the sculpture. In the, uh, yeah, it's called an altar for a plant. So Al it's very altar fitting, for a plant. No? Yeah, yeah. This piece is the. So we put the seeds on the altar of a plant. I have one or two last questions, but before that, I wanted to open it up for questions from you for Ernesto. Do we, do we have questions? Uh, yeah, we've got a question here. Do we need a mic or without mic? I don't know. Mic. Is there a circulating mic? Otherwise, maybe just yeah, without maybe one. We share our mic. Oi. Que história é essa de crochet? What's the story with crochet? So, crochet around 1994. I was doing this work with textile, and I began to think about how is a textile, how do we make a textile? And then I went to my grandmother's house again, and she was there with my grand aunt, Tia Vera, and I told them, I thought they would teach me how to do a crochet, uh, how to do a tricot, a tricot uh, weaving, maybe. This one was too knitting. And, and then she said, my grand aunt said, ah, no, you need to learn a crochet. And then I got afraid because this, this needle was always something mysterious for me. Which is a, which is a, a hand like that. No? And then, 
And then she began to teach me. I began to try. And suddenly I began to do. <laughs> and my grand aunt began to scream to my grandmother who was cooking. Her name is Lia. Now, the diminutive of little Lia in Portuguese would be Liazinha. Liazinha. Zinha, diminutive. Liazinha, he's making. Liazinha, he's making. My understanding is that, that for her was something very weird. A man be, being able to do a crochet with a woman in universe being, you know what? Maybe I'm not so much man like that. <laughs> or maybe she was wrong and everybody can do a crochet. So we're going to have also uh, some classes of crochet is being organized by Angelica to happen there. I also uh, want to say that on the, on the, the opening is on the 29th and on the 30th and on the 1st we're going to have this assembly. Uh, there is some m friends of mine coming from the forest, Hunikuin, Yawanawa, and Tucano too, I believe, né? they got to make the passport, but anyway. Some other guys from Brazil, Ernest Gutsch, who is, uh, the guys, né, that tell, uh, uh, Fabiano Tchanabane and uh, Sian Tchanai Ruibei, they are two Hunikuin, Fabiano, my great partner, uh, Chana, uh, Sian uh, Tadeu, very great brother too. They had been in other exhibitions together and other events and many rituals. Nishuaka, Putani, and Peru from the Yawanawa, great people, masters in this universe. And Alvaro Tucano and Dayara Tucano, uh, great people too. Uh, Ernest Gutsch. Now I understand also, I understand now why last night you said, when I asked you who are your. Hero, heroes and heroines, you said, you know, Brancusi, because your favorite artwork is The Kiss. You said Ligia Clark. You spoke already beautifully about Ligia Clark earlier tonight. And you said your grandmother and your grandfather. Now we know why. Uh, um, I said to him that Brancusi is my grandfather and Ligia Ca Clark is my grandmother. I think we have the right to choose our grandfather and grandmother. No? I mean, just, I, I, I have them in my heart like that. If it's, it's right or wrong, who cares? But, uh, <clears throat> so Ernest Gutsch is this guy who is coming here. He's a Swiss guy, old man, genius. And this guy, he was working with uh, a trans, uh, transformed, uh, how, how, what's the name of it? Uh, bio, uh, transgenic seeds. And he went to Brazil and he saw a lot of pesticides, insecticides, all this poison on the earth. And he got a shock. I don't know the history very well. But he... For many years, he began to develop something that he calls syntropic agriculture. Uh, some other people call agroforest. That is planting the plants together. One help the other. Take the water, protect it from insects, and a lot of cutting to use uh, the parts of the plants over the ground to make the fertilizing without uh, insecticide, pesticide, all these negative things. Then it's very high productive. And this guy is uh, uh, this guy is almost a plant, you know. I visit him. He communicates with the plants. It's something really doing a, a transform transformation in agriculture. Is the totally avant-garde of what's going on. And he's Swiss. He speaks German, so you can speak with him. Also, uh, Luis Alberto Oliveira, who is a cosmologist. Gen genius guy, a gentleman. And uh, Fabio Scarano, who is a, a botanical man. And there is many other people. My friend Damian, who is here, is helping us. Damian Christinger and Daniela Zeman. So we are curating uh, this moment of two days from one, uh, from one to eight at night. Uh, we're going to have this situation that the World Cup is going on. I forget the World Cup. Nobody cares about the World Cup anymore in Brazil. It's a tragedy, you know. Uh, the, the, the things that, you know, we dance samba. We dance samba, you know. Samba, we dance like that. You know. You can't dance samba sitting down. But you can dance rock and roll sitting down. We don't need no education. I can't get no Satisfaction. <laughs> and, you know, it's just a question that maybe they were sitting down and they were doing the guitar play. Now, 
and this culture, different cultures. And in Brazil, we had around the, the field, we had something named General, where people watch the game stand up, and it was very cheap. But FIFA don't like it. Uh, people watching games stand up. They, f they say that it's ugly, that they cannot control, they cannot protect the population, so people should be sitting down, but not up. No ribs, brother. No sensuality. Sex is sex, sex. But anyway, uh, for me, this is a, a crime, you know, it's a cultural crime, and this is a key point that we need to think to go ahead with our planet, what we are doing. Uh, and because of that, it had been dis destroyed. And because the stupidness uh, this of the lot of Brazilians, you know, Carioca people who just think about negative things, about themselves, about wha whatever, don't understand the beauty of these trees, don't understand the beauty of the footballs, uh, the beauty of the art football. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it doesn't matter. They destroy Maracanã because you cannot have a place, you cannot sell a ticket for people to stand up. So many classify, classifying games that I have seen, uh, Maracanã was totally full, but the, the general place where people watch stand up, watch was an incredible thing. A theater, you know, was, you know, people moving here, there. It was such, such a creative thing, you know, harmony, dance, theater, uh, everything together, you know, life. Uh, it, st it stay empty because you cannot sell a ticket for people watching the game and stand up. So World Cup, and the first thing you do is kill the culture of the country who is receiving the World Cup. And you know, there was a lot of protests of the World Cup, and there was a 7-1 on Brazil. And this game, for me, there was a storm. When I, I began to walk, I was crossing Parque Lage, going to a bar from the son of a friend of us, little bar. We were supposed to watch the game there. And these big clowns coming there, dark clouds, man, dark. And I was walking there, I said, wait. <laughs> Brazil was terribly played, man. It was terrible all the games before, you know, I, it's a stupid game that Brazil, <laughs> like that, you know, afraid about everything, you know. And, uh, and we arrived there and begin, uh, beer, blah, all this thing, and, 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 game. and suddenly everything that you saw there, what, what's going on? <laughs> suddenly for a zero. And then, cara, when the game ends, it comes a storm, just like, puff, a storm. And there was rain in Rio de Janeiro until uh, 10 o'clock of the day of the this, this decision of the third place where Brazil played with I don't know who and becoming fourth you know something like that in Brasilia. But anyway <coughs> this game uh it's so kind of suddenly you know a force came to me, you know. Uh, I think I had smoked some pot too, I drink a lot and I had some rapé, you know. <laughs> anyway, besides that some came to me and I begin to go to the water. There was a Marquis Ria and scream Eh, jogo da cura, chuva da cura, jogo da cura, cura Brasil. Chuva da cura, jogo da cura, cura Brasil. Rain of the cure, 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 no? Cure, healing, cure. Cure, I never know how to speak that in English. Cure. Rain of the cure, game of the cure, cure Brasil. Because Brazil was in a, such a bad situation, nightmare, we had a lot of protests, you know, nobody listened, everybody stole, you know, this, yeah, we don't know how to deal very much with this thing, because we don't study, because they teach us that we are Western, we don't study the indigenous, we don't study the Africans, but we are also African, we are also indigenous. No, Judith, if you want to be strong, you need to study who you are, right? We don't study who we are, we study half of who we are. We don't study half, no, one third. We don't study the other two thirds. And we are Africans and we are Brazilians. Because in Brazil, they think that Westerns are high people. You know that I arrived in Rio de Janeiro and there was a woman, a girl, a girl like me, a five friend, you know, we even have danced together someday, you know, this kind of thing. <laughs> Long time ago. <laughs> but I met her just after arriving from Sachet, light, you know, after so many parties in Sachet, it's such a scene there, the sunflowers moving from yellow to black until people cut them, but anyway. Yeah, what a beautiful time I had, me and my family, fantastic. 
and my French friends. And then I was telling the story to my friends. I arrived at the to say to all my friends, guys, we are not Western. And everybody, wow, that's good, you know. But some people don't like that. <laughs> and they begin to, I said, sir, no, because we are not Western. And said, who, who, how come we are not Western? Yeah, we are not Western. And who told, angry already, who told you we are not Western? I said, the Europeans. And who they think they are? I said, the Westerns. <laughs> And you know, so in Brazil, it's like that because if you are not Western, you become a second class people, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry to say about that, you know, but uh, there is this kind of situation. But we need to study who you are. And because we, but the Germans, they went there and they study who Brazilians are. <laughs> because they have classes with the indigenous, with the Patachó. <laughs> you know, because they're not, not uh, smart people. And they dance, indigenous dance at Maracanã around the World Cup. So that game, that 7 1, that's a not a normal score. 7 1 in two teams like uh, German and Brazil. In Brazil, this was a message for me. In this spiritual dimension that I got in, and I really, I'm clear that, that this is all around us, that was a message saying, guys, you are doing everything wrong, you know. Pay attention to what you are doing. So this is part of the answer of the crochet. We need to do our crochet. <laughs> Wish, I wish this conversation under the altar for a plan could continue forever. Uh, we do, however, now come to a conclusion because I think the reception uh, is starting here in the park. So this is end of part two, and we're now going to have a very short part three um, because actually we thought it would be nice that we conclude this conversation by Ernesto writing or doing a post-it for my Instagram. Because I started a couple of years ago an Instagram project. I visited Umberto Eco and uh, Itel Nan, the great artist and poet Itel Nan, and the, you know, the great writer and theoretician Eco. And they both told me the same story. They said, handwriting is disappearing. Doodling is disappearing. It's a catastrophe. We need to do something about it. And it's particularly nice to quote here Etel Nan, because, of course, Etel always says, uh, a day without seeing a tree is a wasted day. So we are sure that today was not a wasted day. Uh, and so both Etel and you know, Umberto Eco encouraged me to do something to save handwriting. As you know, Tim Berners-Lee, who in 1989 invented the World Wide Web, he says we need to save the internet you know, because it's in danger. Net neutrality is in danger. I say you know, we have to save handwriting. So Ernesto agreed to do a post-it now, and then uh, I I will photograph it and put it on my Instagram, but we'll put it here on the stairs, and you are all invited to photograph it as well and put it on all your Instagram. Uh, Ernesto will now start. And that will, of course, be a moment of silence. We also had a moment of silence at the beginning, and I think uh, silence is important. Many years ago, I went to interview Gadamer, the German philosopher, and um, uh, at a certain moment during the interview, he was almost a hundred years old. It was similar like with Nima, you know, he drew in the air. So Gadamer fell asleep during the interview and then, uh, you know, it was difficult because I couldn't really wake him up. I sort of was waiting and just hoping he would wake up. And then the telephone rang and, you know, he answered Gadamer and he was perfectly aware what had happened, you know, and he looked at the camera, you know, he looked at me and, uh, you know, he said, he hung up the phone, he said, I mean, in an interview, he looked at the camera, he looked at me and he said, you'll have a great difficulty to transcribe my silence. <laughs> Hand right is good. Hand right is good. Hand art is good too. We have hands. A tree and it came soft because I would say that Hand right a tree. There is something that came to me that I like to say, so I'm gonna say to you now, you know, in the middle, in between the one thing and the other. A tree is one hand in the total light, and on the other hand, in the total dark. 
dark and light, a tree, the wisdom people of the earth, every plant, a hand on the light and a hand on the dark, the sun and the earth, connection, father and mother, mother earth, mother tree, Gaia, grafismo, Dark light, dark light, dark light, dark light. Bang, 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 bang. Ernesto, thank you so much. Oh, we're gonna put it there. Okay.